Imagine a car that in 1967 looked like it had landed from another world. Pure aerodynamics, an unusually quiet rotary engine, and a design that seemed a full generation ahead. Everything about it felt perfect. But the very car that was supposed to lift the small, West German company NSU to a new level soon became the reason for its downfall. This is the story of the NSU Row 80, the brilliant engineering idea that turned into one of the most expensive mistakes in post-war European automotive history. Felix Wankel began experimenting with rotary piston engines back in the 1920s, but World War II erased everything he had built his facilities were completely destroyed by Allied bombing. With no workshop left, Wankel was forced to become a theorist rather than a practitioner. That changed in 1951, when one of his research papers caught the attention of a small German manufacturer, NSU Motor & Work AG. NSU had also suffered heavily during the war and was only beginning to rebuild itself in the early post-war years. By 1957, NSU's main product was a tiny city car called the NSU Prinz. It used a 20-horsepower air-cooled rear engine and a very simple layout, not far removed from a microcar. But it would be a mistake to mock it. This was post-war Germany, a country still recovering from devastation. People who once drove elegant pre-war Mercedes and BMWs were now getting around in BMW Isetta, or Messerschmitt Kabinen rollers. Against that backdrop, the Prinz looked like a real automobile. Despite extremely limited resources, NSU's engineers managed to create a car that was simple, economical, compact, and, most importantly, affordable. It was designed for everyone, the first-time motorist, the working-class family, and even the elderly pensioner trying to rebuild a life in a shattered country. And in a Germany still lying in ruins, no one was bothered by six-volt electrics or a top speed of 80 kilometers an hour. It wasn't glamorous, but it wasn't walking. Just a year after production began, NSU released a new version called the Prinz Sport. It featured a far more striking body designed by Franco Scaglione of Bertoni in Turin. Bertoni even built the first 250 bodies before production moved to NSU's own plant in Neckarsholm. But the NSU model that became the most familiar to the public was the Prinz 4, introduced in 1961. Its styling involved a young designer we'll meet again later in this story, Klaus Lute. But all these cars, successful as they were for their time, still relied on traditional piston engines, small in size but completely conventional in design. So the question naturally arises, what exactly made NSU so interested in the strange and experimental world of rotary piston engines? The answer was surprisingly straightforward. A rotary engine offered high power output from a very compact unit, and it achieved that with an almost shocking lack of moving parts. There were no pistons, no valves, no timing gear. Compared to a conventional engine, the rotary looked almost elegant in its simplicity. Yes, it demanded much better sealing, and its exhaust was far from clean. But in the early 1960s, these concerns didn't bother NSU too much. To them, the rotary looked like a chance to leap ahead. In 1963, the company introduced the NSU Spider, the world's first production car powered by a rotary engine. Its single rotor unit produced 50 horsepower, and the very idea of putting such an experimental design into a showroom car caused a real sensation. It was bold, unexpected, and unlike anything offered by other European manufacturers. But the excitement didn't last long. The technology was still immature, and its biggest weakness revealed itself almost immediately. The engine's longevity was extremely poor. Compared to a traditional piston engine, the Spider required major work far more frequently, in some cases, three times as often. For an everyday car, that was simply unacceptable. As for the car itself, the Spider was essentially a more sophisticated evolution of the Sport Prince. Compact, stylish, and charming, but not revolutionary in its overall layout. Meanwhile, NSU continued producing various versions of the Prince with conventional engines. Yet, it was becoming increasingly clear that the age of small, rear-engine cars was coming to an end. That layout left almost no room for modernization, and the automotive world of the mid-60s was rapidly shifting toward front-engine, 
front-wheel drive designs. Trying to adapt a rear-engine platform to that new reality was practically impossible. And so NSU made a decisive move. The company began developing an entirely new car, built from the ground up with a front-mounted engine and front-wheel drive. As for the Spider, its production ended in 1967. A total of 2,375 were built, and despite the modest numbers and the many technical problems, NSU decided that its next model would also be rotary-powered. In 1967, NSU made another breakthrough in the automotive world by introducing a truly unique model, the Row 80. This fairly large sedan stood out immediately, especially because of its appearance, which simply didn't fit the overall design language of cars of that era. And remember, this was 1967. The man responsible for this futuristic look was the previously mentioned Klaus Lute, who would later work at BMW and design the E32 and E34. A quick look at European cars of that period is enough to understand just how far ahead the Row 80 seemed. Its styling looked more like something from the early 1980s than from the late 60s. The power unit, designated KKM612, produced 115 horsepower from just 995 cubic centimeters, an impressive figure by late 60s standards. The engine worked with a semi-automatic transmission that combined a conventional manual gearbox, a fluid coupling, and an automatically operated vacuum clutch. With this setup, the Row 80 could reach 60 miles per hour in under 13 seconds, and its top speed was around 180 kilometers per hour. Much of this performance came from the car's excellent aerodynamics. The drag coefficient was only 0.355, an astonishingly low figure for its time. But the Row 80 was interesting not only because of its engine, it featured fully independent suspension, front wheel drive, disc brakes on all four wheels, and rack and pinion steering with power assist. All of this, combined with its unusual design, helped the NSU Row 80 earn the title of European Car of the Year in 1968. NSU invested heavily in the development of its flagship sedan, perhaps too heavily, and the price of the Row 80 reflected the company's attempt to recover those costs as quickly as possible. When sales began, the rotary-powered business sedan cost 14,150 Deutschmarks in Germany. That made it at least 1,000 marks more expensive than the Mercedes-Benz 230 in the W115 chassis. And that, as you can imagine, was already a serious statement. The comparison looked even worse against full-size models from the mainstream segment. For example, an Opel Commodore with a six-cylinder engine was roughly 2,300 marks cheaper than the NSU. Naturally, a high price did nothing to help the Row 80 gain traction on the market. But that wasn't the reason the car ultimately failed. Everything was undone by one single, but absolutely crucial, issue. Despite the engineer's best efforts, they simply couldn't achieve German-level reliability from the rotary engine. Just like with the Spider, its service life was alarmingly short, around 50,000 kilometers on paper. But in reality, it was even worse. Early problems tended to appear at around 20 to 25,000. And from that point on, oil consumption became unacceptable. On top of that, the lively and high revving rotary wasn't just thirsty for lubrication, it was thirsty for fuel as well. Together, these issues became a sentence. Maybe a larger manufacturer, Volkswagen, Toyota, General Motors, could have absorbed a failure like this and bought time to fix it. But compared to those giants, NSU was a dwarf, and it simply didn't have the resources to correct the problem, contain the scandal, or protect its reputation. The company did its best to honor its warranty obligations, which meant NSU had to replace worn-out engines again and again. And on some cars, this had to be done not once, not twice, and not even five times during the warranty period. The engineers tried everything they could. They fought desperately to cure the rotary engine's chronic issues, but they never managed to turn Wankel's design into a truly reliable power plant. Before long, the Row 80 gained a reputation as a temperamental and unpredictable machine. Sales, modest even at the beginning, started to fall sharply. It's no surprise that NSU's financial situation soon became dire, and by 1969, just a year after winning the Car of the Year title, 
the company had effectively lost its independence and was taken over by Audi. To their credit, the new owners didn't immediately kill off the troubled model. Instead, they tried to eliminate the most serious issues, and the R080 certainly had more than one weakness. Its sound insulation, for example, was far from ideal. The chronic wear of the rotor tip seals and the breakdown of the side plates were addressed by switching to a new material, a titanium carbide alloy known as ferrotic, which replaced the previously used alloy steel and cast iron. This made the engine noticeably more reliable, but it also made it significantly more expensive to build, and that, in turn, raised serious questions about the economic viability of continuing with a rotary-powered model at all. The early 1970s dealt an even heavier blow to the Row 80. The global energy crisis hit, and a car that was already seen as unreliable, with an engine that was thirsty, short-lived, and far from clean, even by the standards of its time, simply lost whatever demand it had left. NSU even tried replacing the rotary with a Ford V4 of conventional design, since it happened to match the rotary's overall size. But no other engine really fit the Row 80. The rotary was so compact that the designers had been able to give the car a very low, almost flattened nose, something they proudly presented as a unique feature of the model. No one back then could have predicted that engineers would eventually try to squeeze a conventional engine into that same space. The final chapter came in the spring of 1977, when the last NSU Row 80 rolled off the assembly line, the very last car to carry the NSU badge. Production of the company's other models had already ended earlier in the decade. From that point on, Audi NSU Auto Union AG focused solely on building Audi vehicles. And in 1984, the company was renamed simply Audi AG, marking the moment when the historic NSU name finally passed into history. In the years that followed, only one company in the world continued to pursue the rotary concept seriously, the Japanese manufacturer Mazda. In the early 1970s, before the oil crisis hit, Mazda genuinely planned to build an entire rotary-powered model range. The company installed the Wankel engine in virtually everything, from small sedans to full-size family cars. Only later, when reliability problems became apparent and fuel consumption increased dramatically, did the rotary survive solely in Mazda's sports models. And even in the new century, despite the company's resources and strong engineering base, Mazda never managed to eliminate the rotary's two main weaknesses, limited engine life and significant oil consumption. NSU's bet on the Row 80 was essentially an all-in move. The company understood perfectly well that it couldn't compete directly with giants like Mercedes or BMW, but they hoped that the Row 80 would mark the beginning of a worldwide march for Felix Wankel's engine, and that NSU itself would stand at the front of this new movement. Unfortunately, as we now know, that bet didn't pay off. 